people of Arata, separated from other people, the people whom God elected from other people. They stood in the midst of the flood, after the flood swept their over. This is a portion from the earliest written legend about the world flood, which has been preserved in Sumerian sources. Here, the country of Aratha is mentioned as the place of salvation. The same story is repeated in the Bible, where the name Ararat is used as another variation of Aratha. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the water swelled on the earth for 150 days. The waters gradually receded from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. The ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The mountains of Ararat, the country of Ararat, the kingdom of Ararat, these are the names that used for Armenia in the Bible, which is noted as the place of humanity's salvation and rebirth. The book of Genesis presents Armenia during the prehistoric times, through the stories of the birth of humanity there and the subsequent world flood, while in the following books of the Bible, Armenia is mentioned in the context of historical events that took place in the 7th to 6th centuries BC. The Bible in the book of Genesis, when referring to the events surrounding the world flood, calls Armenia Ararat. In three subsequent books of the Bible, the country of Ararat is mentioned in connection with the events happening in 681 BC, when the sons of King Sennacherib of Assyria murdered their father and fled to Ararat, Armenia. Armenia is noted in a third subsequent episode in Jeremiah's prophecy. In 590s BC, the prophet Jeremiah called upon the great and powerful countries of the north, including the kingdom of Ararat, to come to the rescues of Jews to help them fight against iniquitous Babylon. In Mesopotamian cuneiform inscriptions, the alteration of vowels A and U was very common. Thus, the name of the country Ararat in Assyrian and Babylonian cuneiform inscriptions was recorded as Urat. The earliest form of the place name Ararat is recorded as Aratha in Sumerian sources and is dated to events that took place in the 28th to 27th centuries BC. The Sumerian sources, like the Bible, present Aratha as the place of salvation of humanity after the Great Flood. Research indicates that Aratha of the Sumerian sources, Urartu of the Assyrio-Babylonian sources, and Ararat of the Bible refer to the same country. That is to say, those are the ancient names of Armenia. In the middle of the 20th century, the earliest biblical texts were found in the Palestinian city of Qumran, and they also confirmed that Urartu was the altered variation of Ararat. The place name Ararat was recorded with an intermediate form of Urarat, thus linking and affirming that Ararat, Urarat, and Urartu are simply slight alternatives of the same place name. Armenia is also mentioned as Urartu on the most ancient map of the world, 
which was created in Babylonian and is dated to the first half of the first millennium BC. The original map is kept in the British Museum in London. This is the circle which represents the world. And this is the water round the world. And these round circles are the main cities of ancient Iraq. And this particular label here is the name of Urartu in Babylonian cuneiform writing. Writings of the Babylonians, and especially the Assyrians, are well familiar with the name Urartu because there was an important kingdom in the north of Mesopotamia called Urartu, with whom the Assyrians had a lot to do, including battle. It has changed slightly. Urashtu and Urartu is just an alternative. And the cuneiform signs for this are written here. And I can show you what they look like. It looks like this. One, two, three. U. Ra. Ash. Two. Armenia was referred to as Ararat in the Bible as well as in subsequent medieval Christian literature. Even today, many Armenians lovingly refer to their country as the Araratian country. Today, in academic literature, only one of the ancient Armenian kingdoms is usually referred to as Urartu, which was founded around the Basin of Van Lake and between the 9th and 7th centuries BC, included the entire Armenian highland and a number of adjacent regions. The capital of the kingdom was Tushpa Van. That is why it is also called the Kingdom of Van. Armenia was already recorded as Urartu around 880s BC, 50 years prior to the establishment of capital city of Tushpavan, and continued to be called Urartu centuries after the fall of the Kingdom of Van, in inscriptions written in the Babylonian cuneiform all the way to 360s BC. For example, Armenia is called Urartu in Babylonian language in the famous Behistun inscriptions, which tells about the events of 520s BC. In an inscription that is repeated in three different languages, Armenia is called Armina in Farsi, Harminuya in Elamite, both of which are variants of the name Armenia. And in the Babylonian, Armenia is called Urartu. Armenia continued to be called Urartu in Persian inscriptions as long as the Babylonian language was used. Thus, Urartu, as one of the archaic names of Armenia, was used in the cuneiform inscriptions of the ancient world for about 500 years, from around 880s to 360s BC. Only about half of this period refers to the era of the actual kingdom of Van. Nevertheless, as today it is more common to refer to the kingdom of Van as Urartu, which existed from the middle of the 9th to the end of the 7th centuries. We will also maintain this chronological order in Armenian history and use the terms Urartu and Urartian to especially refer to this period. Every state is created in any given place through sheer force as well as a number of internal and external factors. When on what basis and where was the kingdom of Van or Ararat Urartu established? The late Bronze Age, that is to say the middle of the second millennium BC, saw the emergence of large state conglomerates. The Urartian state was one of the latter developments of this process. When we look at the early Iron Age, that is to say the period from 1200s until 900s BC, we see that there was a singular cultural milieu which uh, covered all of the Armenian highland. In an archaic period such as the second millennium BC, there were no great means of communication. 
and there was not a single state structure which united all of Armenian highland. Thus, the existence of a common cultural unity throughout all of Armenian highland indicates common ethnic and spiritual kinship that was shared by its inhabitants. <laughs> In the beginning of the first millennium BC, the Urartian state began to urge. It uh, naturally formed as a result of all those processes which began during the second millennium BC. And in the sense, it is very interesting that the system of dwellings which emerged during the second millennium found its further development during the Urartian period. It indicates that the Urartian state formed in the Armenian highland during the Bronze and early Iron Ages. At the end of the second millennium BC and the beginning of the first millennium BC, Assyria launched a wave of attacks on the Armenian highland. Armenian state formations thus were pushed to forge closer ties and unite against the common enemy. Three powerful states emerged during this time. The central and northeastern regions of Armenia were united around the Ararat area, which gave its name to this formation. In the northwest, the state of Diauhi Taik was established, and in the south, around the basin of Lake Van, the Naidi Federation emerged as the most powerful and united its leadership, the southern provinces of Armenia. All of these three formations were viewed by Assyria as three different power centers of the same country and were often called in cuneiforms by a common name. Since the 13th century BC until the beginning of the 9th century BC, Assyrian sources refer to the Armenian highland by the more generic name of Naidi. However, from 860s BC onward, the Assyrians started to use Urartu as common name for all of Armenian highland. This was due to the strengthening of King Aram of Ararat, who extended his rule throughout the entire Armenian plateau, when the kings of Tushpavan became stronger and started to rule the territory of the entire Armenian highland. The Assyrian scribes called it Urartu, since as noted above, the Assyrian regarded those kindred states as simply three power centers of the same country, which was called by one common name. Between 1860s and 1840s BC, Assyrian sources mention Arame the Urartian three times judging by the available information. He was able to unite most of Armenian highland into a single state. Among his wars against Assyria, one episode is especially worth mentioning. Arame, although had a large army, decided to show resistance in his capital and instead retreated toward the hills. Due to this action, the Assyrian king Salmanazar III decided to return home, which indicates that Arame achieved his objective. Mayrakhagakhe yerkri kentronakan khagakhe thornel hakarakortin yev nahanjel to withdraw from the capital, which was the center of the country, and leave it to the enemy, which was a calculated strategic retreat, was an innovative move. Later commanders were hesitant to take such action for a number of reasons, and it only once again became popular in military strategy after Russian troops, led by Mikhail Kutuzov, retreated and surrendered Moscow. This was a good example of the argument made by military strategists that the most important element in winning war is not the capital, or the territory, but the actual army that is fighting it, and if it remains intact, can recapture the lost territory. Some of the scholars identified Arame the Urartian with the Aram, who was the progeny of Haya, the forefather of the Armenian people. The 5th century father of Armenian history, Movses Korenazi, mentioned that Aram's rule was centered around the Ararat Valley. According to Korenazi, Aram had repulsed an Assyrian invasion. A number of scholars believe that the Korenazi combined several kings that were named Aram and who ruled during the 3rd to the 1st centuries BC, among whom was Arame the Urartian of the Assyrian sources. Being a hard-working and patriotic man, 
he preferred to die for his country rather than to see how the foreigners trampled his native soil. After finishing the battle against the eastern invaders, Aram with the same army moved upon Assyria and found there another occupier of his native land who was named Barsham. Aram waged battle against him and chased him through the Corduini to the fields of Assyria. From the 1830s BC, Naidi, which was located in southern Armenia, began to strengthen its position. It emerged from around Lake Van Basin and gradually extended throughout the entire Armenian highland. Since the Assyrian, Babylonian, and ancient Hebrew scribes called Armenia by the common name Urartu Ararat, the newly emerging Naidi, or the Kingdom of Van, was also continued to be called by this name. The kings of Van, in their inscriptions, call their country Naidi and Bjaina. Naidi was the old traditional name, and the name Bjaina was a variation of the name Van since cuneiform writing does not have the sound V, so the country of Vana in cuneiform is written as Bjaina. In 1830s BC, Sarduri I established the capital of Tushpavan on the eastern bank of Lake Van. On a huge natural rock formation rising on the banks of the lake, he built an impregnable fortress with high walls and powerful towers. This fortress was destined to become the capital of not just the kingdom, but that of a great superpower. In Assyrian inscriptions, Sarduri is mentioned as the king of Urartu, and in the records about the foundation of the capital he called himself the king of Naidi. The inscription of Sarduri, son of Lutipri, the great king, mighty king, king of the universe, king of Naidi, which has no equal, the great shepherd who is not afraid of war, the king who punishes the disobedient. Sarduri, the son of Lutipri, is the king of kings, the one who taxes other kings. Sarduri, the son of Lutipri, says, I brought the stones from the city of al Niwini and built this wall. In the inscription about the founding of the city Sarduri I is represented with the titles of Assyrian kings, which include the titles like the Great King, Mighty King, King of the World, King of Kings. Probably he took over these titles after his victories against Assyria. It is known that his army in 833 BC successfully fought against the king of Assyria, Salmanazar III, on the southern slopes of the Armenian Taurus Mountains. There was a great deal of debate among scholars about what was the primary territory of the Kingdom of Van before the foundation of the capital Tushbavan. Based on the similarity of the names Urartu and Ararat, some suggested that initially the kingdom was centered in the Ararat Valley. However, this point of view was later rejected, as the inscriptions noted that the kings of Tushbavan launched their raids from the basin of Lake Mon, and kings such as Menua and later Argishti I conquered the Ararat Valley, which obviously showed that the latter was not their core territory. The other point of view 
which was put forward and is the most popular one today, is that the core area of the Urartu Kingdom was centered in eastern and southern regions of Lake Van Basin. It was here that the three main cultic centers of the three supreme gods in Ardini Musasir, Kumanu, and Tushpa were located. Tushpa was also the capital of the Kingdom of Van. Others have suggested that the primary territory of the kingdom could have been situated in the southwestern part of Lake Van Basin, in the region of the Armenian Taurus Mountains. This point of view is supported by a good deal of evidence and seems the most plausible, especially from a cultural perspective. The culture of the Kingdom of Van, especially its written culture, was inherited from the Kingdom of Mitanni, which flourished especially in the 16th to the 13th centuries BC. The actual territory of Mitanni was southwest of the Armenian highland and northern Mesopotamia. This could mean that the Kingdom of Van could have inherited from Mitanni a number of cultural elements, including its written system. Thus, this could mean why the Kingdom of Van shows certain cultural similarities to Mesopotamia and at the same time Asia Minor. This is also natural in light of the fact that the core area of the Kingdom of Van was situated on the crossroad of these two regions. Sarduri I was followed by his son, King Ishbuini, who resigned between 825 to 810 BC. He carried out important reforms, which continued during the reign of his son, Manua. The religious reform was of special importance. A common state pantheon was created which was recorded on the cliff called the Door of Meher. The creation of local cuneiform writing system was an important achievement. As a result of military reforms, the army, which previously consisted of a militia, was replaced by a professional standing army, which was divided into different formations. A large network of defensive fortresses and fortifications was created. Thanks to these and other reforms, the state increased its strength and its borders were significantly expanded. Thanks to Ishbuini's policies, the country of Mana, as well as Ardini Musasir, which was the main cultic center of the supreme god Kaldi, centered in the basin of Lake Urmia, were added to the kingdom of Van. The northern border reached the Haikakan Par Ridge, which runs across the central portion of Armenian Highland. During the reign of Munua, who succeeded Ishbuni and ruled from 810 to 886 BC, the Kingdom of Van became very powerful. This greatly contributed to the economic development of the country. An artificial irrigation system was created. The most significant of these was the 72-kilometer-long canal, which the king named after himself, although later it was more commonly called the Canal of Semiramis. Manua left a great deal of inscriptions about the construction of the canal. Fourteen of these have survived.
By the power of Kaldimanua, the son of Ishbuini, built this canal. It is called the Canal of Manua. By the greatness of Kaldimanua is a powerful king, a great king, the king of Biainili, the lord of Tushba. Manua says, let the one who destroys this inscription, who breaks it, who forces someone to do this, who says, I built this canal, be destroyed by the gods Kaldi, Teshiba, and Shivini. Due to victorious military campaigns of King Manua, most of the Armenian highland was united under one centralized state. Though the regions of northern Armenia were not part of the Kingdom of On, they still accepted its supremacy and agreed to pay tribute. In the second half of this reign, King Manua spread his rule to the basin of Lake Urmia and was of the Euphrates River. He also controlled the territory to the east going across the Sagros Mountains, including the main trade roads that led to Asia Minor. Manua defeated Assyria, the superpower of the ancient Near East, and turned the Kingdom of An into the dominant superpower. The kings of Van frequently organized military training events. One of the inscriptions of King Manua records an exceptional result during one such event. By the power of Kaldi Manua, the son of Ishbuini says, right from this spot, the stallion named Artsibi under Manua jumped 22 L's. An L is equal to 51.8 centimeters, that is to say 22 Ls would equal to 11 meters and 39 centimeters. The record of Manua's stallion named Artsibi, or Artsiv in Armenian, Eagle remained in place for some 28 centuries until a new record was set in 1975. During the reign of Argishti I, son of Manua, which lasted from 786 to 764 BC, the Kingdom of Van reached an unprecedented success. The borders of its territory spread from the southern banks of Lake Urmia to the territory of Javak, from the basin of Lake Sevan and River Kerr to Meletian and Tabal countries, Asius and Kordin mountains to the basin of Cherok. Argishti I founded a number of new city fortresses. In particular, the most significant one among them was Erebuni, which was founded in 782 BC, thus placing the foundation of modern Yerevan, the capital of the Republic of Armenia. By the greatness of God Kaldi, Argishti, son of Manua, built this mighty stronghold and proclaimed it Erebuni for the glory of Biainili Urartu, and to instill fear among the king's enemies. Argishti says the land was a desert before the great works I accomplished upon it. By the greatness of Kaldi, Argishti, son of Manua, is a mighty king, king of Biainili and ruler of Tushba. In six years after the foundation of Erebuni in the Ararat Valley, the king founded another new fortress city of Argistikanili, near the old capital city of Armavir. These became the main northern fortifications of Argisti I. The king also built another city, named Argistikanili, in the region of Mush and western Armenia. After uniting Armenia Highland and some adjacent regions into a single state, Argishti I directed the main vector of his foreign policy against Assyria, fighting for supreme dominance, 
throughout all of the ancient Near East. It is worthy to mention that beside wars, Argishti I made attempts to achieve this goal through skillful diplomacy and astute geopolitical moves, as a result of which Assyria was surrounded and increasingly cut off from its neighboring territories. Thus, in pursuit of this policy, Argishti I conquered the territories in the western and southern parts of the Iranian plateau, reaching Babylon, or the country of the city Babylu. Thus, the trade roads by which raw materials were delivered from the east to Assyria were cut off and the latter found itself under a blockade from the north, east, and south. Afterwards, similar steps were taken by Argishti to blockade Assyria from the west as well. This policy of isolating Assyria was also continued by Argishti's son and successor, Sarduri II. Argishti also undertook noteworthy action in the north. It is known that the most northern region of his kingdom was Javak, which is mentioned in the cuneiform inscriptions as Zabaka. However, archaeological evidence shows that Argishti ventured further north. A burial chamber was found in northern Caucasus, where a military commander was buried. The helmet bears the name of Argishti I. Presently, the helmet is kept in Berlin's Museum of the Ancient Near East. This helmet was not the only one that was found. Similar helmets of Argishti were found in Abhasia, Ossetia, and Trek near Javak. They show the political influence of Argishti I and the scope of his action in the north, which expanded his rule beyond the Great Caucasus Mountains. Pastoral Meng Tesumeng or Argishti Arachini Orok, Vanita Kavurutsuna, Vochmein. In fact, we see that during the reign of Argishti I, the Kingdom of Van included not only all of Armenian highlands and neighboring countries, but expanded to northern Caucasus in the north and the Persian Gulf in the south. It is very rare in world history when a king or a commander makes an admission about the strength of a rival. Uh, one such rare confession was made about Argishti I. Shamshu Ilu, the supreme commander of the Assyrian army, while speaking about Argishti, confessed that even his name is as formidable as a heavy storm. The strengthening of the Kingdom of An continued also during the times of Sarduri II, who ruled from 764 to 735 BC, who was the son and successor of Argishti I. During his reign, the Kingdom of An reached his greatest territorial expansion. In the north, the kingdom's rule reached the Black Sea, including the country of Kulka or Kolchis. The northern east border of the empire reached the Kerr River. For the first time in the cuneiform inscriptions of Sarduri II, Artsakh was mentioned as Urteki in the east. The border of the empire reached the Captain Sea, and in the west, Asia Minor. By repeating the victorious campaign of his father, Argishti I, Sarduri II, reconquered Babylon and expanded the border to the Persian Gulf. Sarduri, the son of Argishti, marched forward. Sarduri says, I marched to the country of Babylon, conquered Babylon and reached the country of Barauta. By the greatness of Kaldi, Sarduri says, I conquered three fortresses that had been reinforced. I conquered them after combat. I conquered 23 cities in one day, demolished the fortresses, burned the cities, and took the country. The king's southwestern policy, which centered on the eastern basin of the Mediterranean Sea, was also important. Sarduri II was able to reach unprecedented success in this area, which prior rules of Kingdom of Van had never reached. Sarduri II established his rule over Damascus, which was known as Ruishuiani in the cuneiform sources and spread his control over the eastern basin of the Mediterranean Sea. From here, Sarduri reached Babylon, 
by conquering territories adjoining the Euphrates Valley. Thus, through such moves, he could destroy the power of Assyria through a virtually complete encirclement. During the reign of Manua, the Kingdom of An became a superpower of the ancient Near East, and thanks to Argishti I and Sarduri II, it became the sole leading power of the region. This period lasted for more than half a century. Sarduri II created an empire whose borders reached four seas. However, the goal of the Kingdom of An to achieve a long-lasting encirclement and eventual destruction of Assyria were never fully achieved. In 743 BC, the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, in the territory of present-day, Syria was able to stop the advance of Sarduri II's forces further south. Thus, Assyria was able to save itself from a complete encirclement. Eight years later, in 735 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III made a counter-attack and marched towards the capital city of Tushpavan. He was not able to conquer the capital. However, Assyria regained its previous status as, along with the Kingdom of An, as one of the two superpowers of the Near East. There is more praise in Armenian history towards Argishti I than there is towards his successor Sarduri I, though the latter was able to conquer more territories. This is mainly due to two reasons. Argishti remained undefeated throughout his entire rule, while Sarduri II sustained defeats and losses during the last period of his reign. Additionally, Argishti I was the founder of Erebuni Yerevan, which is the present-day capital of not only Armenia, but one can say the capital of all Armenians worldwide. The conflict between Assyria and Ararat Urartu reached its climax during the reign of King Sargon II of Assyria and Rusa I of An. Victories during the wars between Assyria and Armenia fought during this time flung from one side to the other. Initially, Kingdom of An was able to score several victories. In 714 BC, Sargon II took advantage of the raids of the warlike Sumerian tribes who invaded the Kingdom of An from the north. King Rusa I found himself under attack on two fronts and suffered defeats. Rusa I sustained territorial losses in the south. However, during the latter part of his reign and during the reign of Argishti II, the Kingdom of An was able to regain these territories. In 714 BC, during his retreat back to Assyria, Sargon II plundered and destroyed the chief temple of the god Kaldi in Ardini Musasir. According to his own account, Sargon took from the temple gold and silver statues which weighed many tons. He also seized precious goods, large amounts of weapons and ammunition. We learn from this account that during this time there was an attested worship of ancestors. Sargon notes that in Ardini Musasir, next to the statues of gods were also the statues of Rusa I's father and grandfather, Argishti I and Sarduri II respectively, both of whom were crowned with a star, which is a sign of divinity. The Kingdom of An continued to remain as one of the superpowers of the ancient Near East during the reign of Rusa I's successors, Argishti II and Rusa II. Nevertheless, the political situation throughout the region had changed. By the end of the 8th century BC, new powers had emerged in the region, and the Kingdom of An in Assyria increasingly sought to avoid conflict and wanted to find a more common ground for cooperation. The kings of An renounced their policy of southern expansion and focused more on eastern, western, and northern directions. Argishti II is best known for his military expeditions in the east, 
which resulted with the conquest of the territory which later on became known as Atropaten. Argisti's forces probably reached the Caspian Sea. Inscriptions that were found on the territory of Atropatin, as well as inscribed bracelets, which were found in what is today the Iranian province of Gilan, affirms this. A notable period in the history of Kingdom of An was during the reign of Rusa II, son of Argishti II, which encompassed the years from 680 to 650s BC. Scholars have dubbed this period as the rebirth of Urartu's strength. Rusa II achieved a measure of successes in his foreign policy and reached the central parts of Asia Minor after conquering five countries located in this area during his Western campaign. More importantly, Rusa II was able to establish close ties and forged an alliance with the Sumerians. He facilitated their advance to the east of Asia Minor and subsequently to the territory of what later became known as Cappadocia. Afterwards, Rusa II helped direct Sumerians from the territory of Asia Minor against Assyria. <laughs> որտեղ Ասորեստանի արքան հարցում է կատարում իր քրմերի միջոցով գերագույն աստված աշուրին In a number of Assyrian cuneiform inscriptions, the king of Assyria fearfully asks his priest to find out from the supreme god Ashur whether the Sumerians in the alliance with Rusa would march against his country. Effectively, Rusa made his 50 years long enemy, not only his neighbor, but more importantly, his ally whom he directed from Cappadocia against his arch foe Assyria. This speaks of a great diplomatic potency of the king. If today the inheritor of Urartu's heritage was not Armenia, but one of the great superpowers of today, it would surely make this episode find its way into the best annals of the history of diplomacy. Rusa II also carried out many construction works. One of these was the erection of the fortress city of Teixebaini, or Karmir Blur, which is located in the present territory of Yerevan. Fortress named in honor of the god of war and courage, Teixeba. Argishti Yekorti Vortin, Rusa Yekorta, Karutsele Aiskavak. Rusa II of the son of Argishti II built this city. And for the construction of the city, he needed a significant amount of manpower, including workers and material. Thus, his raids and Kamajini in the northern and eastern directions gave him an opportunity to acquire these means in order to build his most glorious undertaking, the city of Teixebaini. The results of the analysis of the DNA that has been extracted from Teixebaini during the archaeological excavations shows that the DNA of the inhabitants of Armenian highland during the Kingdom of Van period and the DNA of modern Armenians is virtually identical. Genetic studies show the same virtually identical DNA pattern of the inhabitants of Armenian highland during the 4th and 3rd millennia BC with the DNA of modern Armenians. These important finds clearly show that there is a direct and virtually unbroken continuity of Armenian. These important finds clearly show that there is a direct and virtually unbroken continuity of Armenian genes on the territory of Armenian Highland for at least the last five to six thousand years. After the reign of Rusa II, the Kingdom of An gradually declined. One of the last kings of An, about whom we learn in a dated inscription, was Rusa II's son Sarduri III, who is mentioned in Assyrian sources as a modest king. In 643 BC, Sarduri III sent ambassadors to the king of Assyria, congratulating the latter of his conquests. Very little specific information is known after the reign of Sarduri III. The weakening and the decline of the Kingdom of An was also caused by the Scythian tribes invading from the north. When and how exactly the Kingdom of An fell remains unknown. This is due to the lack of information. The inscriptions of the Kingdom of An, as well as those of weakening Assyria, do not possess this information, and the very scant information preserved in records of the new Babylonian Kingdom, as well as the Bible, are not clear 
whether they are referring to the Kingdom of Van or to the following Armenian dynasty, since both were referred to as Urartu and Ararat. Regarding the New Babylonian period, we, we do not have any certain um, information about Urartu because we don't know what happened uh, to Urartu after the second half of the 7th century. And the New Babylonian period began with the uh, reign of Nabopolassar in 626 BC. Some authors believe that Urartu was destroyed in 640 BC, whereas other people want to see a continuity and believe that Urartu survived until the first uh, quarter of the uh, um, 6th century BC. There are several viewpoints today about the actual date of the fall of the Kingdom of Van. Of these, we can reject the theory that the kingdom fell sometime around 580s BC. Another suggestion that has been made is that the kingdom fell sometime around 640s BC due to the natural disasters. Of course, further research needs to be made in order to sustain such a theory. However, the most probable and convincing theory remains the one that Kingdom of Van fell sometime during the fall of its arch foe, Assyria. We know that three states had concluded a military pact against Assyria. These three states were made up of Media, Babylon, and Armenia. 5th century Armenian historian Movses Korenatsi tells us that Armenia was led in his alliance by Paruyr, who Armenian kingdom stretched from Lake Van to the Euphrates River. According to Korenatsi, Paruyr was one of the representatives of the elder branch of the High King. Paruyr took part in the invasion of Nivet. 612 BC, for which he was crowned by the king of Media. In the Babylonian Chronicles, the last and most crucial period of the history of Assyria is told in details. Assyria did not fall after the conquest of their capital, Nivea. For another seven years, the Assyrians resisted in order to save their state. Their last stronghold was the city of Karkemish, on the banks of the Euphrates River. In 609 BC, in order to surround and destroy Carchemish, the Allied forces decided to attack from two directions. The Babylonian army moved from the south along the Euphrates River, and the Median army entered Armenia, and after joining the Allied Armenian army, launched its attack from the upper Euphrates in the north, thus completing the pincer movement against Assyria. When the Median army in 609 BC entered the Lake Van Basin, it was already under the rule of their ally, the new dynasty of the High Kid Yervandunis. By this time, the Kingdom of Van had already ceased to exist, and a new dynasty had succeeded in its place. Judging from the archaeological evidence, the transfer of power from the royal dynasty of the Kingdom of Van to the succeeding dynasty had taken place without any serious internal conflict. Probably, that transfer took place through a palace coup. There is an interesting traditional account about this. It might surprise many that all of the important deeds undertaken by the kings of Van in the collective memory of the Armenian people were merged into one collective character, Queen Semiramis. For example, Sarduri I built the capital city of Tushpavan, whereas the Armenian historian Movses Korenatsi ascribed it to Semiramis, calling Van built by Semiramis. Enua built a huge 72-kilometer-long canal, leaving many cuneiform inscriptions which attest that its name is the Canal of Menua. Yet the people, despite this called the canal, the water of Semiramis, or the Canal of Semiramis. Huge cuneiform inscriptions were left on the cliff of An by Argishti I and Sarduri II. 
Yet Korenatsi also ascribed these inscriptions to Semiramis. He also ascribed to Semiramis all of the cuneiform inscriptions of Armenia. However, we know that the cuneiform writing system in the Armenian highland had been commonly used only by the king of Van. This means that all of the important works undertaken by the kings of Van were combined and ascribed by the people to the collective character of Semiramis. It has its explanation, however, in this particular case. We are interested about the actual fall of the Kingdom of Van's fall and find the following element of interest. Semiramis in the Armenian folklore did not turn into a pigeon, an escape like it is recounted in the Mesopotamian and Greek folklore, but after being pursued by her own son and soldiers dies on the banks of Lake Van, turning into a rock. Thus, the legend about the death of Semiramis, preserved in the Armenian folklore, could also contain evidence about a possible palace coup that took place in the Kingdom of Van. Borders of every state change in the course of its history. Initially, of course, they are usually more modest as we see it in the case of the Kingdom of Van during the reign of Sarduri I. But during the reigns of Ishbuini and Manua, the borders of the kingdom expanded, and in times of Argishti I and Sarduri II, the domain reached its greatest territorial extent. After this period, the kingdom returned to its main borders, which remained for the following century and were inherited by the subsequent Armenian kingdoms and dynasties that followed. The main territory of the Kingdom of Van is seen through an outline of fortress and fortifications as well as the locations of monumental inscriptions made by its kings. This is exactly the same sea, where the subsequent Armenian kingdoms also forged their history an area which rightly so called in the 19th century by European geographers as the Armenian Highland. The most northern inscriptions of the kingdom were found in the basin of the beautiful lake, which is known in Armenian sources as the Northern Sea, and today is also called Childer, though in the cuneiform inscriptions of the kings of Van territories which are situated further north are also mentioned as part of its territory including Armenian Javak, which is today part of Georgia, as well as the territory of Kulhoch, or Kolchis, which is to the southeast of the Black Sea. In the northwest, the main stronghold of the kingdom was the ancient fortress of Altin Tepe, near Erzinka. The original name of this fortress during the Eurasian period has not been preserved. 2003 yılından beri burada Altın Tepe'de kazı çalışmalarını yürütüyoruz. İkinci dönem. Excavations have been carried out here in Altın Tepe since 2003. This is the second phase of excavations. The first phase of excavations was carried out from 1959 to 1968 by Professor Tashin Ogsgyuch. He summarized the results of his excavations in a two-volume book. During the Eurasian period, a fortress was built here. The excavations showed that in the earlier Bronze Age period, there was a settlement here. In this section, we are carrying out excavations for the first time. For the first time near the southern wall of the remains of a storage room have been found, and we are presently excavating that part. This year, we have also excavated the fortress's drainage system and the outer walls. The fortress of Berdak, which today is submerged under a reservoir, is especially praised for its construction in Western sources. Berdak in Armenian literally means a small fortress. The original Armenian name has been distorted and in Turkish is pronounced as Berte. In 
in a cuneiform inscription which was carved on a cliff door near the Balu fortress, which stands on the banks of the Aratsani River. King Manua recorded the oldest names of the region as Tsupani, recorded as Sopk in medieval Armenian chronicles, and Kuzana, which in the 20th century became the center of the heroic Dersim, resistance known under the name of Hozat, which was destroyed by the Turkish government during the Dersim genocide perpetrated against its civilian population between 1937 to 1938. Artsakh, which was recorded in the cuneiforms of Urtek, was noted as the main region of the Kingdom of Van in the northeast. Today, this region has become more familiar to the world under the name of Nagorno-Karabakh. The southeastern provinces of the Kingdom of Van are located on what is today Iran. We have some noteworthy Eurasian centers on the territory stretching from Maku to the southern areas of Lake Urmia. The most famous of these is Bastam, the ruins of which approximately 50 years ago were discovered by Wolfram Kleist, who discovered many of the ancient sites in this area, including the remains of the Temple of God Galdi. We have a variety of Eurasian inscriptions in Iran, which have recently been discovered and are of great importance. It may be interesting for you to know that these discoveries were made after the Islamic Revolution. The archaeological works were carried out in certain areas of Khoi and Salmast, and as a result we discovered more than 50 ancient sites, tombs, etc., some of which are being uncovered as we speak. These are the main borders of the Kingdom of Van, which roughly correspond with the confines of Armenian highland. And the spheres of influence of the kingdom spread far and beyond, reaching northern Caucasus in the north, the Persian Gulf in the south, and Asia Minor in the west. The Kingdom of Van emerged as a confederacy of southern Armenian states and thus played a significant role in forging the history of Armenian statehood. Gradually, the subordinate kingdoms transformed into administrative units of the state. A stable government apparatus was created with a vibrant multi-tier government system. The system remained in place for more than a millennium until the fall of the Kingdom of Greater Armenia in the 5th century AD. power of the king as the head of the state was unlimited and was inherited from father to the eldest son. The supreme authority of the state, including the power of the supreme judge and the commander-in-chief of the army, were all in the hands of the king. He was considered to be the earthly representative of the supreme god Kali and took all his actions in the name of the supreme deity. In this respect, the coronation being one of the most important events of the state merits special attention. The king, when recounting the story of how he became a king, stated the following. When I sat upon my father's throne, Kaldi bestowed me with royal power. There is a sentence in one of the texts that notes, and Kaldi erected for me the tree of the kingdom. Thus we see that the power of the king is closely connected with the worship of the sacred tree, which we usually refer to as the tree of life or the tree of the world.
It is not a mere coincidence that one of the most common and prevalent motifs in the art of the Kingdom of Vaughn is the Tree of Life, which is often depicted flanked by two beings or divinities. Fortunately, the description of the coronation ritual was survived. Additionally, the coronation rite is also presented in the inscriptions of King Sargon II of Assyria. The one who is to inherit the throne is taken along with gold, silver, and everything precious to Musasir to stand in front of Kaldi, where he presents his gifts. Countless well-fed bulls and rams are sacrificed in front of him. A feast is organized for the entire city. He is crowned with the king's crown in front of his god Kaldi. The scepter of the kingdom of Urartu is handed to him, and his people hail the name of the new king. After his coronation, the king would ceremoniously carry out his first deeds. These are quite interesting. First he would plant a new garden, thus this symbolized that he should first and foremost take care of his country, and only afterwards would he march against his arch enemy. The third deed that the new king had to do was the erection of a new temple. The Kingdom of Van also had the institution of the Council of Elders, which was subordinate to the king and served as his advisory body. The existence of such a council in Arata is attested in the Sumerian sources to as early as 28th to 27th centuries BC. During the medieval times in Armenia, it was known as the Land Council. Junior representatives of the royal family were given an important role in the political, economic, military, religious, and cultural life of the nation. The country was divided into large regions, which were ruled by governors. In subjugated countries, the power was often left to the former king, who was obliged to pay taxes and take part with his troops in the military campaigns of the Kingdom of Vaughan. A number of royal agencies along with their titles were recorded in the cuneiform inscriptions, i.e. ruler, governor, border governor, army commander, chief priest. Among members of the royal court were chief scribe, keeper of the seal, treasurer, accountant, soman, senior shepherd, chief huntsman, baker, etc. The bureaucratic serving staff was quite large. For example, the service personnel of the royal palace of Musahinili, near Tushpa, numbered 5,507 members. Of these 119 were scribes and were subjected to the royal accountant. Interesting information about the military forces of the Kingdom of Van has been preserved. During the reign of Ishbuini and Manua, the army underwent reforms, and the irregular troops that were mustered during the times of war were replaced by a standing army. The commander-in-chief of the army was the king. During a war, two generals were appointed as his deputy commanders. There were also regiment commanders, captains, and officers of lower ranks. The army was divided into three segments, the infantry, the cavalry, and the charioteurs. Urartui metaga mushakutian, metaga gortutian, yev razmakan parki muskare boraguin. One of the most outstanding aspects of Urartu is its production of metallurgy. Its military, especially its chariots and cavalry, were supplied with the best metalwork of the period. The depictions of cavalry and chariots on the bronze belts, shields, quivers, and other metal items show how important these formations were for the army of Urartu. Urartu. 
The army was divided into regiments, each consisting of 3,000 troops. These in turn consisted of companies made up of 50 soldiers. Wars were considered to be an expression of the will of the gods, so it is not surprising that there was a triumphal military march, which in and of itself was a sacred ritual. The military campaigns began with a special prayer and a ritual ceremony that was held in the Temple of Gaudi. During the ritual, the kingdom announced the objective of the particular military campaign, as well as the direction of the raid. After the ritualistic prayers and other rites, the army launched the campaign. In the years of the largest expansion of the kingdom during the reign of Sarduri II, the king records in his chronological inscription that the total number of the armed forces of his kingdom surpassed 350,000. Understandably, this number also included the armed forces of conquered tributary countries. This is similar to the later army of the Armenian Emperor Tigran the Great, whose army numbered 300,000 soldiers, of which only 100,000 were Armenians. The soldiers were armed with iron and bronze swords, daggers, spears, pikes, axes, slings, slingshots, bows, and quivers, each containing 36 arrows. It becomes evident from the materials discovered during the excavations that the soldiers of Van wore metal-plated breastplates, bronze conical helmets, and bronze shields with wide edges. During the attack of Sargon II in 714 BC, the Assyrian records that from the temple of Ardini Musasir alone he plundered 305,000 swords, 25,000 shields, 1,500 spears, and other weaponry. The kings of Van often organized tournaments and military competitions. Besides the aforementioned horse racing record of Manua, another remarkable cuneiform inscription from the reign of King Argishti II has survived. Argishti, son of Rusa, shot an arrow right from this spot, in front of the forest of Gilurani, to the garden of Ishpilini, son of Batu, 950 cubits long. That impressive distance equals to 1,614 feet. According to Assyrian sources, the army of Urartu had music bands, which played various wind instruments and drums in order to raise the morale of the soldiers and frighten the enemy. Assyrian sources also tell us that the fortress guards of Urartu would send a signal to each other about enemies' movements by lighting bonfires. For the Kingdom of Van, the war was also a means of acquiring slaves. About half a million slaves were captured during the wars fought by Argishti I and Sarduri II. They served mainly in construction and repair of cities, fortresses, temples, canals and roads. In ancient times, when the belief systems were also a way of life, the role of religion was very important in the governance of the state. The pantheon of gods of the Kingdom of Van was codified during the reign of King Ishbuini and was inscribed upon the rock called the Door of Meher. We learn from the cuneiform inscription that the pantheon was headed by three supreme gods, Kalvi, father of the gods, the creator of the sky and earth, De Sheva, the god of war, courage, thunder, and Shivini, god of the sun, whose main worship center was in the capital city of Tushpavan. There were also gods of fields, mountains, seas, and other elements.
The pantheon of the Kingdom of Van had a classical Indo-European character. It had three-tier structure of the supreme, chief, and secondary gods. The pantheon consisted of 70 gods and goddesses, equally divided into 35 masculine and 35 feminine deities, and also around 30 angelic beings. The equal amount of the gods and goddesses shows that in the Armenian reality of the time the idea of monogeny was prevailing. Only male animals, bulls and rams, were sacrificed for all the gods and female animals. Cows and sheep were sacrificed for goddesses. There were no exceptions to this rule. This meant that there was an animal sacrificed for every god or a goddess according to his or her gender. It is clear that why Arminians today sacrifice only male animals during the ritual of sacrifice. An ancient tradition has survived. Only male animals are sacrificed since the Holy Trinity of Christian Armenia is headed by God the Father. It is noteworthy that God Kaldi, who headed the pantheon of the Kingdom of Van, just like many other gods of single-centered pantheons, was a creator-maintainer and at the same time a destroyer of all things. Such was also Aramaz, the supreme god of the last Armenian pantheon just prior to the adoption of Christianity. Some important details about the religious rituals of Urartu Ararat have survived. A special importance was given to the celebration of the beginning of the spring solstice held on March 22nd. It was believed that the fortune throughout the year depended on how well the beginning of the year in the spring was celebrated. The first month of the year was named after the sun. On the first day of the month of the sun, sacrifices to all the gods and goddesses were made, in line with the belief that their benevolence and blessing had to be secured for the rest of the year. The actual number of animals that were to be sacrificed to each deity was inscribed on the door of Mer, which during this time was known as the Gate of Kavdi. Throughout history, various people's beliefs about life and death were expressed throughout their burial rituals. There were three common burial sites in the Kingdom of Van. The most common of these was a simple burial. Sometimes there were cases of cremation. A far less common practice was the ritual dismemberment of the body. This practice was also later uncommon to Zoroastrianism. The inscription of the Door of Mer notes a special god in the pantheon of the Kingdom of Van, who is recorded without a name, and whose function was to be a mediator between this world and the underworld, whose description was a god who carries the souls. The agricultural and horticultural rituals also played an important role in the life of the Kingdom of Urartu Ararat, among which particularly the rituals associated with the cultivation of grapes were emphasized. The rituals of consecrating new edifices were also accompanied by animal sacrifices. Rituals and sacrifices were held when a new city, a fortress, even an ordinary house was built. In this respect, the inscriptions found in Karmir Blur are interesting. They note what particular body parts of an animal should be sacrificed to what class of people. There was a designated part for the priests, a designated part for commoners, and the heart of the particular animal was designated specially for the king.
Almost all aspects of life in the Kingdom of Van were intertwined with religion. The writing, culture, and science were also connected to religion and religious practices. The written culture of the Kingdom of Ararat Urartu, just like in many other states of the ancient Near East, was multilingual and contained many characters. The official records of the kingdom used three languages, each having its own writing system. Vani Takavurutsian Pashtonakan Gragrutsian Mech Kirarvelen Yerek Grain Hamakarke Rens Lezunero. Three writing systems were used in the official inscriptions of the Kingdom of Ban. Sarduri I made inscriptions about the foundation of the capital city of Tushbaba. Six of these made in the Assyrian and Assyrian Babylonian cuneiform writing has survived. Ishbuini, the son of Sarduri, created a local cuneiform writing system, and afterwards, Assyrian cuneiform writing in Assyrian language can also be seen in the official bilingual writing. Records of the Kingdom of Van, the latter being used as a regional lingua franca. The local cuneiform writing system was created during the reign of King Ishbuini, son of Sarduri I. We specifically note that it was created since it was not a simple copy of the cuneiform system borrowed from Mesopotamia, but instead underwent great deal of reform and modification. The Assyro-Babylonian cuneiform during this period consisted of around 600 characters which were polysemic. Thus a scribe or a literate person living in Assyria should have learned and remembered about 3,000 words, syllables and sounds in order to be able to read a simple text. After adopting this difficult system, a reform was carried out in Armenia and a local writing system was created. It simplified the writing system from 600 characters to mere 200 and almost entirely eliminated the polysemy. Thus, if a scribe in Assyria had to memorize about 3,000 words, syllables and sounds, in the Kingdom of Van, a scribe or a literate person had to remember about 200 to 300 characters, that is to say only mere one-tenth of the characters used in the complex Assyrian cuneiform writing system. The new writing system was quite flexible and had its own numbering system. As of today, more than 600 inscriptions written in the system have been found. In general, there are about 1350 archaeological artifacts that bear inscriptions written in this local cuneiform writing system of the Kingdom of Van. La documentazione scritta urartea è la più antica the Urartian written records are the most ancient one throughout this vast territory, not only in the Armenian highland but also in the northern parts of the Iranian Plateau, in northeastern Turkey and the Caucasus. Throughout all of this mountainous area, people started to write in cuneiforms right here, that is to say, in Armenia. Per la prima volta, in tutto questo territorio di montagna, per la prima volta si comincia a scrivere in cuneiforme qui, in queste zone, in Armenia. The language used in the cuneiform inscriptions of the Kingdom of Van deserves special attention. In academia, it was dubbed as Urartian Pyainian, and earlier even Chaldean. Only very limited vocabulary of the language, with about only around 400 roots words, have been identified as far among the more than 600 records. The records have a cliché character, and the language, for about three centuries, had hardly underwent any changes, which indicates that it was rather the language of official records and was not the colloquial language of the people. Another strange peculiarity is that the language used in the inscriptions, on the one hand, has great deal of commonality with Urian, yet, on the other hand, has extensive number of Armenian words. The relationship with Hurrian language can possibly be connected with the kingdom of Mitanni, which reached the height of its power between the 16th to the 13th centuries BC, whose writing system was possibly later inherited by the kingdom of Van. One of the main languages used in Mitanni for record keeping was Hurrian. 
Urartian is the only language which is um, uh, related to Hurrian. Um, uh, uh, Urartian was spoken in the, uh, uh, or at least it was, uh, it is attested in inscriptions of the um, uh, eighth and uh, late ninth, eighth and seventh century uh, BC, mm. and. Um, uh, uh, the study of uh, Urartian uh, helped a lot to understand the older stages of Hurrian because uh, the two languages separated apparently uh, rather early, presumably in the late third millennium or in the early uh, second millennium. The existence of a large number of Armenian words in the cuneiforms of the Kingdom of Van can be explained by the fact that the inscriptions were made by the local Armenians. Among the three main writing systems used in the Kingdom of Van, only the Biainian Urartian hieroglyph writing, known as Mechenagir, was completely devised locally. This writing system consisted of around 300 hieroglyphs, which were written from right to left and from up to bottom direction. The key for decoding these local hieroglyphs was found in 1995. Today about 20% of these hieroglyphs, that is to say some 60 characters, have been decoded and explained. The first results of this study indicate that the language used in this writing system of the Kingdom of An was ancient Armenia. When many years ago, one of the imported non-Armenian cuneiform systems used by the Kingdom of Van was deciphered, some scholars assumed that since this writing system, which was one of three, was not in Armenian, this is indeed a very weak, even absurd argument, since the ethnic composition of any state cannot be indicated by the official language used in its writing system. A good example of this would be medieval Europe, where the official records of all of the European states were made in Latin. Using this argument and logic, all of the medieval European states should be considered Latin in their origin and ethnic makeup. The issue of ethnic makeup of the kingdom of Ararat Urartu also became the subject of various political speculations. We will not dwell upon some of the most outlandish theories put forth by certain falsifiers of history and who have been rightfully identified as such by other scholars. One thing is certain, the state can be identified with the ethnicity that created it and whose interests it represented. The kingdom of Ararat Urartu most certainly represented the interests of the Armenian people and its work of unifying all of Armenia not only lasted during the period of the Kingdom of Van, but continued on during the subsequent millennia of Armenian state formations and dynasties. Fortunately, some of the important achievements made during the Kingdom of Urartu have been preserved. There were two types of arithmetical systems, one based on a hieroglyphic model and the other one on a cuneiform one. In the hieroglyphic model, the numbers were written as points, circles, and contingent signs. This was a unique Armenian system that was devised in the Kingdom of Van that did not have a parallel in other places of the ancient Near East where numbers were indicated with lines or cuneiform-like lines. This is the case in the Egyptian system, in the Hidi Luwian hieroglyphic system, as well as in the cuneiform writing system of the ancient Near East and only Armenian hieroglyphics indicate numbers by points and circles. The other arithmetical system used in the Kingdom of Van was based on the cuneiform model and could allow to write any given number from 0.5 to infinity. Here we see the sign which represents a half. The system was based on the decimal model and numbers 1 to 9 were written by using these signs. 
This is the sign for number 10. For example, the number 12 would be written by adding two points after 10, and 30 would be written in the sign for number 10, repeated three times. The same principle was utilized to connote numbers in their hundreds and thousands. There were specific signs that represented 100 and 1,000. Thus, by repeating the sign of 1,000 two times, the number of 1 million was indicated. Another repetition indicated a billion, and so on. This principle could be applied until infinity. This model allowed without utilizing zero to record any number from half to infinity. The fact that Arminian Highland was the birthplace of astronomy, or one of its birthplaces was outlined in the 19th century by European astronomers, such as William Olcott, Nicholas Flammarion, Carl Swartz, Edward Maunder, and others. In their works, they trace the origin of the constellations of the zodiac to Armenia, as they appeared there in the beginning of the third millennium BC. This theory was further strengthened in the middle of the 20th century with the discovery of the ancient observatory of Metsamor in Armenia, which was dated to the third millennium BC. The observatory served as a gazing point for observing the constellation of Orion, known as Hyk in ancient Armenian. A map of the heavenly sky with accompanying planets and constellations was also discovered on the Sevsar mountain, along with an astronomical calendar. These discoveries confirmed that even prior to the rise of the Kingdom of Van, there was already in Armenian Highland an advanced measure of astronomical knowledge. And it is not a coincidence that in the structure of the state pantheon, the solar calendar also found its expression. Thus, the pantheon had a three-level structure, the supreme, primary, and secondary gods. The Pantheon was ruled by three supreme gods and three supreme goddesses. And among them stood the one supreme god who was considered the creator of all. Thus the number of supreme gods in the upper level was seven, which corresponded to the number of days in a week. The second level consisted of six chief gods paired with the same number of goddesses, making up a total of twelve, which corresponded to the number of months in a year. The third and last level of secondary gods consisted of 26 gods paired with the same number of goddesses, the total being 52. This was the number of weeks in a year. Another noteworthy number is that there were 35 gods and 35 goddesses in the pantheon, paired with each other into 35 families. This is identical to the number of days in a month in ancient Armenian, Egyptian, and Zoroastrian calendars. That is to say, a month in these calendars consisted of 30 days plus additional five days. Zoroastrian calendars. Advanced astronomical knowledge is also attested through the discovery of other archaeological artifacts, particularly on the bronze belts of the Kingdom of Van, an interesting artifact found during the archaeological excavations and presently kept in the history museums of Armenia deserves special attention. Երկար ձգված կիսագնդի տեսք ունեցող կավ է այս հետաքրքիր հուշարձանը բոլոր կողմերից պատված է սեպագրով։ This fascinating long clay monument with the shape of an extended hemisphere is covered on all sides with cuneiform writing. It is noteworthy that the character for God or sky is repeated for seven times and passes through its central axis. The character of God and sky was written in cuneiform using the same character. The repetition of the same character for seven times is done on purpose. There are seven lines on the right and left sides of the central axis. Additionally, the hemisphere is sealed with seven seal impressions on both of its sides. The lower part has twelve lines. Thus, we here have a very interesting depiction. Seven lines on both sides, which could symbolize the seven celestial luminaries, and on the bottom, twelve lines, which could represent the underworld. If not the most ancient, this certainly is one of the most ancient models of the universe, which fortunately was preserved. Certainly, further research in this field will yield new discoveries in the future. Even now, there are interesting studies in this area, 
Some believe that great secrets have been encrypted into numerical codes in the cuneiform inscription of the Door of Mer. I thought that I in this inscription, I noticed that we are dealing with the law of mathematical lambda, a pattern in which the arithmetic progression, harmonic progression, and geometric progression are at work. And besides all these, there is a comparison of formula patterns of many numerical systems, which function as a whole. This is exceptional and very interesting. For example, there is a small Saros. It is the periodical phase of solar eclipse of 54 years. In the inscription of the Door of Mer, the number of bulls sacrificed for the three supreme gods is 27. This inscription is repeated twice. Thus, we have 2 times 27, which equals 54. I want to highlight a very interesting fact that the periodical phase of 54 years is distinguished only in the Sumerian calendar, which in their system was also is indicated as 2 times 27. We see the same in this duration inscription, and it has its parallel in the Armenian epic, the daredevils of Sasson. We are familiar with a large number of cities, fortresses, palaces, temples, cave shrines, tombs, and other buildings from the Kingdom of Van. The main peculiarity of the architecture of this period is the combination of the achievements of the pre Eurasian construction techniques of Armenia with the traditions of Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. Since the earliest period of the history of the Kingdom of Van, great deal of effort went into construction of fortresses and other fortifications. So far, about 300 large and small fortresses throughout the territory of the Kingdom have been discovered. These, along with mountain chains which served as natural barriers, made the country very hard for the enemy to penetrate. We get a sense of their exterior design by looking at some of the art of the kingdom which often depicted these fortresses. It is interesting to note that even though the Kingdom of Van controlled vast territory stretching from the North Caucasus to the Persian Gulf and from the center of the Iranian Plateau to the center of Asia Minor, the kings of Ararat only built major fortresses on the territory of the Armenian Highland. That is to say, they mainly fortified their native land. In the center of the fortress cities was usually a massive citadel surrounded by two or three layers of walls. The citadel contained the temple of the supreme god of the nation, as well as its governor's palace and the military barracks. The dwellings of the inhabitants were built around the citadel, and its layout was based on a general plan which was made up of well-defined linear and parallel streets. One of the most characteristic features of Uratian architecture is one that has only been recognized for about the last 40 years. I'm referring to the standard Uratian temple, which was usually dedicated to the god Haldi. And uh, this kind of temple, interestingly enough, was nearly always placed on the highest point of the mountain. It would be higher than the palace because it was the, the house of the god. And the form of this uh, temple was a square with buttressed corners. And the walls were very wide, three meters 15 or some, something of that size. And so we believe that it was a tower temple that went up to a great height, perhaps 16 meters or something of that kind. It would have been a very monumental structure, always placed on the very top of the mountain. The regulation for the construction of sacred architecture was also important. They were mainly made up of two categories, temples and gates of God. I suppose one of the outstanding features of Aratian monumental architecture is the fact that it grew up and flourished in a mountainous terrain, in a mountainous country. So the rock of the mountain was the foundation on which the Uratian architect and builder relied. And for example, 
many times an Urartian fortress would be placed on the spine of a, of a very narrow hill so that the Urartian architect learnt to build in very confined spaces and to go vertically upwards or to go at, to greater lengths to get monumentality. But he could build fantastic structures in, in a very small area on the rock of a mountain. Which were carved upon cliffs of exceptional importance is the chief temple of the supreme god Galdi in Ardini Musasir, which was founded in the 8th century BC. This one-of-a-kind monument, unique in its architectural forms, became known thanks to one of the bari leaves found in the palace of the Assyrian king Sargon II. The main facade is depicted on the relief showing its central pediment and six columns erected on the high pedestal. The temple has a high pediment, a double slanted roof decorated with an acrotarian. It is in a form of the tree of life which symbolized the eternal nature of divine power. It is very likely that the widespread motif of the acrotarian that is so prevalent in the great the Greco-Roman world derives its origin from architecture of Urartu. The temple of Ardini Musasir, which its double slanted roof and triangular pediment is the oldest among the pillared temples of the ancient world. Indeed, leading scholars and architects have traced the spread of Urartu's temple building style, later known as Perepteros, to Asia Minor and from here to Greece, Rome, and eventually to other parts of the world. The most famous among the gates of God is, of course, the Door of Mer. Here, the complete pantheon of the gods and goddesses of the kingdom of An is recorded. This gate and other similar constructions are called in the cuneiform inscriptions as the Gates of Kaldi. Thus, it is not surprising that some scholars have rightly seen similar attributes between the two deities, Kaldi and Mir and Mitra. The name Kaldi probably meant the god of illumination and the god of love, which is completely in line with the attributes and epithets ascribed to the god Mir Mitra. It is noteworthy to add that many scholars agree that Mitraism entered the Roman Empire from Armenia around the first century AD, the cult of Mir Mitra in Armenia. In its early manifestations was associated with the god Kaldi and earlier with the god Mitra of Mitanni. The oldest monument of the Gate of God that has been discovered so far was found at Ashotakert. It is situated between the Lakes Vaughan and Urmia. It is known to the locals as the Door of Ashot. A resident of a nearby village, an old Kurdish man recounted an anecdote ascribed to the origin of Ashotakert. Long ago, the Armenians had a king who was named Ashot. He was powerful and thanks to him, his country, prospered. But King Ashot was not happy with the behavior of his people, locked himself inside the cliff. Ever since this cliff was named after him, the Door of Ashot, a Kurdish man added, if you really know the exact reason of why he became angry with his own people, you have to ask the Armenians. Interestingly enough, even after 100 years of the Armenian genocide, when most Armenians were killed, the Kurds picked up the original Armenian oral tradition and passed it down from generation to generation. This is the same story of the Door of Mer of the Armenian epic Daredevils of Sasson, in which the hero Mer, upset at the wrongs and injustices of the world, closes himself inside the cliff, which ever since bears his name as the Door of Mer. King Ashot, who in this case is used as a substitute for Mer, embodies the collective memory of the last great Armenian kingdom of the Bagratunis. As the name Ashot was the most common name among the kings of his dynasty and was the name of the dynasty's founder. When looking at these monuments, which are called the Gate of God, one cannot but not to think about the millennia of history that are linked through them. The sun god Mir Mitra, the hero of the Armenian national epic Mer, the kingdom of Ararat Urartu of the 9th and 7th centuries BC. The Bagratid kingdom, which existed in the 9th to 11th centuries AD, 
And finally today, 100 years after the Armenian Genocide, these monuments are witnesses and still carry the memory of to whom this land actually belongs. Besides monumental architecture refinement of stone in Ararat Urartu reached high levels of development in the spheres of sculpture and production of household goods. The stone statues reached a great deal of sophistication. The most notable of these were the seals made from various minerals which often depict images such as the Tree of Life, lions, chariots, and other scenes. Many household items, including basins of various shapes and sizes, pipes, borers, craters, and other implements, were made from relatively soft stone types. Stone processing was also widely used in metallurgy. Casting molds were often made of stone. One of the most important manifestations of the art of the Kingdom of Van were frescoes. Both religious and secular scenes were depicted in the frescoes of Ararat Urartu that adorn temples, palaces, and other buildings. It is evident from the preserved remains of these frescoes that images on the walls often had a single edge ornament that consisted of several years. These depict rosettes, step towers, tree of life, animals, mythological creatures, as well as other deities and figures. The military and the political strength of the state mostly depended on the level of its economic development. The Kingdom of Van reached great results in the sphere of agriculture and various crafts. The creation of a network of irrigation canals was one of the most important achievements of the Kingdom, along with successes in developing new gardening techniques. Exceptional results were also recorded in winemaking. The excavated wine cellars have yielded enormous jars which have a capacity of several tons. The tradition of winemaking in the Armenian Highland is very archaic. Here in Areni, the world's oldest winery and a cellar were discovered. The oldest leather shoe was also discovered here. They are carbon dated to more than 5,500 years ago. In the mountainous and foothill areas of the Kingdom of Ararat, cattle breeding and animal husbandry was prevalent. The crafts and trade were highly advanced and naturally this helped the growth of the economy. The rapid economic growth was also greatly boosted by the exploitation of the rich metal mines and the widespread usage of metal tools. Armenian Highland had an ancient tradition of metal processing. This is affirmed by archaeological excavations as well as written records. During the Kingdom of Van, period metal production reached new heights, especially in the production of arms and armor. Various shields, helmets, swords, daggers, spears, body armor, axes, clubs, bronze belts, and other weapons have been found. These artifacts correspond to the depictions of the soldiers of Urartu Ararat by Assyria and the Kingdom of An. The art of metal production reached a new degree of perfection. The sophistication of some of the gold, silver, and other jewelry adorned with precious stones astonishes the finest jewelers of today.
The surviving medallions from the Kingdom of Vaughn have a religious character. It's worth to mention that on two silver medallions that were found in Carmir Blur, the head of the god was carved on a gold frame that was welded onto silver. This is the most ancient or one of the most ancient depictions of a halo in the history of world art. On another medallion, which is now kept in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, we see a gold welded upon silver work, depicting in full the god Galdi. Metal processing in Urartu was really exceptional. Many scholars, starting with Lemon Haut and a number of prominent scholars of the 19th century, expressed the opinion that, for example, the Etruscan metal production started as a result of its contact with Urartian metallurgy. Urartian influence had a huge impact on the latter academic empire. Urartian metalworks were discovered in faraway Ukraine. All of this was pointed out by Piotrovsky. Assyrian King Sargon II's inscriptions also attest about the development and production of metallurgy in the Kingdom of Van. His troops during the above noted raid on Ardini Musasir in 714 BC plundered nearly two tons of gold, five tons of silver, and more than 100 tons of copper and iron items. The processing of iron also has millennia old tradition in Armenia. During the Kingdom of Van period, iron was still unknown throughout most of the world. The prominent British archaeologist Sir Gordon Child in the 1950s was surprised to learn that at the beginning of the second millennium BC in Armenia, the melting of iron from ore was discovered and was kept as a secret from the rest of the world for nearly half a millennium. Additional finds have been made since the time of Sir Gordon Child. So where was the origin of one of the most important fields of metallurgy, that is to say iron production located? So far, the greatest number of artifacts have been found in northern Armenia. The ancient iron horse bridle was discovered in one of the royal tombs and after a very accurate radiocarbon analysis was dated to 24 to 23 centuries BC. Among the crafts, pottery had also been very developed. These pots, made with a unique skill and incomparable quality, are also unique pieces of art. Thousands of pieces of pottery which had various practical purposes were made. La ceramic, uh, c'est un indicateur. Pottery is a unique indicator. It is also an indicator of technological skill. It is an indicator of technological skill, measured of its productive application and level of artistic taste. Therefore, for me, pottery is a good measuring rod and an indicator of understanding a particular civilization. In order to understand the civilization of Urartu, one needs to understand how this empire was organized how it was built up economically. The art of woodworking and bone etching was also highly developed in the Kingdom of Van. There are few very exquisite surviving samples of the latter, understandably due to its more fragile nature. There are less preserved wooden items which most have been used significantly, particularly in furniture production. That is also attested by numerous bronze hollow stands that were put on the stilts of wooden furniture, which in turn gave them durability, increased their aesthetic appearance, and underlined their religious nature. 
the ancient Eastern culture, furniture with sacred animal legs motifs is largely used, thus emphasizing its ritualistic and worshipping significance. Animal-legged furniture is represented abundantly in Urartian art, both in found objects and depictions. In this context, a famous throne found in Rusakhineli, now Toprakale, is worth to be mentioned. It dates back to the times of the King Menua. Its original appearance was restored. It was decorated with sculptures of griffins and its front legs were executed in the shape of lion paws. There are many lion pawed furniture legs that are prevalent in the art of Ararat Urartu, including parts of thrones, hoofed tripods, crutches, candlesticks and pots. Bronze belts and plates are rich with striking ritual scenery of thrones and altars adorned with animal legs. During the ancient times, the kings of both Armenia and Mesopotamia, as a sign of their divine power, wore crowns adorned with bull horns, which in these regions represented the worship of the supreme god of thunder, whose sacred animal and the symbol was the bull. In the kingdom of Van, some furniture legs appeared as lion paws along with furniture legs in the form of bull's legs, which is connected with the declaration of Kaldi as the supreme god. In Mesopotamia, furniture with hoofs or bull legs of different types, as well as objects and images with these motifs, were extremely popular. In Egypt, lion paws were popular, whereas in the kingdom of Van, both of these motifs were equally represented. Remarkable advances were also made in urban planning, which made the lives of inhabitants so much easier. It is remarkable that 3,000 years ago, the domestic culture of Ararat Urartu, in various towns and dwellings, reached extraordinary achievements with sinks, toilets and drainage systems that can only arouse a feeling of great admiration. This is in light of the fact that even a millennium or two after the fall of the Kingdom of Van, this kind of urban planning remained virtually unknown in many parts of the world. Such was the history of the kingdom of Urartu Ararat, with its cultural heritage, religion, system of governance, military, architectural wonders, and scientific achievements, pantheistic creation, and everyday way of life. It felt an indelible imprint in the history of both Armenia and that of the ancient world. The role of Urartu is important, and I think it is also very important for Armenia since this, when its nationhood began. It is not a coincidence that the borders of Armenia and the Armenian nation during the Middle Ages are almost identical with the borders that existed during the Urartian Kingdom in the first millennium BC, 1500 years before that. The area populated by Armenians virtually corresponded to the exact borders of Ararat Urartu up to 1915. That is to say, prior to the policy of extermination during the Armenian Genocide, carried out by the Turkish government against the native population of Armenia, as a result of which most of Armenian highland became devoid of its native population and was forcibly annexed by Turkey. 
Of course, the civilization of Uratu as a whole is a very interesting one and one which we are still working hard to understand completely. It is difficult to study Uratu because the, the land of Uratu is now part of the land of many different nations and occupied by people speaking different languages, scholars writing in different languages. It is very difficult to pull all the strands of Uratian studies together. But we have understood by now that it was one of the great distinctive cultures of the ancient Near East, standing with especially the Assyrian culture just to the south and having many very special and very delightful aspects. Ararat Urartu was a kingdom with beautiful traditions. When the new king rose to the throne, the first thing he would do was plant a garden, face off against an encroaching enemy that threatened his realm, and in order to honor the gods and strengthen the spirit of his kingdom, build a sacred temple. Their remarkable achievements in building fortifications um, uh, and what we, we learned from the inscriptions about their, uh, uh, their water works, um, canals and, and artificial um, uh, lakes, um, the, the, uh, length, uh, the, the change of landscape to, to uh, turn it into, into a, a garden of uh, fruit trees and so forth. This is a remarkable contribution to human uh, uh, cultural history. Remarkable observations about the historic mission of the civilization of the Kingdom of Ararat were made at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century by scholars Mikhail Nikolsky and Nicholas Adonz. They pointed out that whatever the virtues of the Assyrian civilization were, its flaws outweighed them. Assyrian kings cared little about the value of human life and boasted about burning tens of thousands of people alive slaughtering whole villages and towns, and erecting pyramids with severed heads of their innocent victims. We do not see any such cruel parallels of inhumanity in the records and inscriptions of the kings of Ararat. These scholars underlined this sharp contrast and pointed out that the kingdom of Van also deferred and stood out in terms of its outstanding cultural contributions to the progress of human civilization. And perhaps this is why Armenia has continued to exist in an unbroken way, carrying those humanitarian principles from the ancient times of Ararat to the present. Armenia is the only country that is shown on the world's oldest Babylonian map that still exists today, always steadfast in facing new challenges and tribulations. There is something interesting to be said when you look at the map today because the places which are named are either ancient cities or they are areas where tribes lived, important tribes, or they are parts of the world, countries in other words. Well the tribes who are named on the map have disappeared forever and the sites which are listed which are drawn by the scribe in the circles, all those sites are now ruined. Their kings have disappeared, their time has gone, they are finished. But Urartu, which is the kingdom of Armenia, is still alive. And I think that's a rather wonderful thing to think about when you look at that ancient map. Arata Ararat Urartu Armenia. The history of this country begins from the time of creation and remarkably continues in an unbroken manner until the present. Armenia was noted in many ancient sources as the place of the Garden of Eden, or terrestrial paradise, the place of sacred wisdom and immortality, the place where humanity was given a second chance and underwent rebirth after the Great Flood. Kingdoms are forged and destroyed 
Yet the sacred values that were created endure, and the sacred names are not lost to time. The kingdom of Ararat Urartu fell 27 centuries ago, but the country and the people of Ararat continue to live on. The symbol of this holy land is its highest mountain, and this mountain carries the sacred name that comes from the beginning of history, Ararat. <laughs>